Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Goha Thakurta. And with me here is Professor Balveer Arora. He's uh, chairman of the Center for Multilevel Federalism and a former professor of political science at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He taught political science there for 37 years between 1973 and 2010. And uh, he was also the rector of the university. Thank you, Professor Aurora, for giving me and the viewers of NewsClick your time. And I'm drawing heavily on your recent post in Facebook, where you start your post by saying, who is the chief strategist at the helm? Combining inputs from epidemiologists to economists. And you've used very, very harsh words. You said Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, has so far provided comic relief from clanging pots and pans to candles to petals being showered by aircraft and helicopters of the Indian Air Force. Are you saying that there is nobody who's a strategist? Or are you suggesting that Mr. Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, is unable to strategize and therefore is only providing comic relief, diverting attention, if I may use that phrase, getting people their thalis and their thalis and lighting candles and diyas to showering petals. I'm saying a bit of both in the sense that we have to understand two major things that we are living through. One is the lockdown, which is very harsh, which is implemented uh, with vigor, often uh, ruthlessly. Uh, and the other is that we are confronted with a pandemic where the experts know little uh, about the disease. They are learning as it progresses and they are telling us what they know. On the other hand, the economists are worried that the, uh, the global economy will slip into a recession uh, that it will be take a long time uh, to pull out. So what I was hinting at uh, in the uh, sentences that you mentioned was that lockdown is an administrative measure. The Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, in its own wisdom and ways, does it. On the other hand, you have the medical experts who themselves are uh, fishing around, uh, finding their way uh, globally. And it's not just here, looking at the way uh, each of the other countries is handling. To make sense of all this, you require vision. You have, require political statesmanship. You require acumen. You require uh, an overall view of how to balance the pros and the cons. And that can't be left to bureaucrats. The experts are on tap. They should never be on top. And what we know of the cabinet uh, is that there are very few uh, ministers who make the cut. So hence the question, is it the prime minister himself who is leading us through what is, uh, in my view, the most difficult phase that we have crossed, that we are crossing since partition? in terms of the mass migration, the destitution, the pauperization, the hardship that people are having to face. You've written, you've described the PM Cares Fund as a slush fund of no use to the suffering. And the party which once proclaimed the oneness of India, I presume you are the, the Bharatiya Janata Party, has paradoxically managed to fragment it by pursuing petty electoral calculations to divide and rule. It has used federalism to settle political scores in the process, weakening the nation more than ever before in its independent history. 
As we head into the worst economic recession we've known in living memory, it is the lack of leadership which is being felt, which is being cruelly felt in New Delhi. A lot of people are arguing that, you know, whether it was announcing the lockdown, at that time, the prime minister himself was right up front. When it comes to withdrawing, easing the lockdown, it seems he is now not up front anymore. We have these statements being issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs. But most importantly, since you have uh, been studying uh, federalism in the Indian context, and you're the chairman of the Center for Multilevel Level Federalism, the states are broke. The states are complaining they don't have enough money. And the lockdown and the secession of economic activity has worsened their finances. They're owed money by the union government. Yet, the state governments are being asked to bear the burden of the problems, not just of the migrant workers, but trying to revive economic activity at one level and at the same time ensure there's no widespread starvation, food is provided to everybody who needs it. So the responsibilities are with the states, but the central government seems to be less than willing to be generous in helping the state governments. Is this a correct, uh, a correct way of looking at, at the present situation? I think you've um, hit it on the head. The core issue here is that this battle against um, the coronavirus is being fought by the states at the state level. They are the front line in this combat and they need all the support. Simultaneously, the lockdown has uh, whittled away many of their uh, sources of income, of revenue, and the center has not been able to give them uh, their dues uh, for the GST uh, that was coming to them. Now, in this situation, I think the problem that we face is that on the one hand, you have a huge fund uh, which the Prime Minister has set up uh, parallel to the <coughs> National Relief Fund, which has all the clearances. Uh, it counts for CSR, it counts for, uh, it counts for uh, uh, the foreign, uh, uh, it, it is uh, allowed to receive foreign contributions, none of which uh, is available to the state's chief minister's uh, relief fund. So, you know, the problem here is that it has created suspicion. It has created apprehensions as to why, what is this fund used for, going to be used for, what use it, is it, if uh, at this time of need, uh, it is not coming forward to help the people. And here I would like to say, uh, 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 go a little further. I think democracy under this lockdown may be suspended to the extent that assemblies are not meeting, but we must remember that we are still a functioning democracy. Democracy has not been abrogated. The emergency provisions have not been invoked. Uh, and the states are full partners in the federal system. I think a white paper on the part of government is needed to dispel all the suspicions, all the apprehensions. The government should come clear with its version, with the truth, because the white paper is supposed to put down in black and white the truth as the government sees it. For example, I give you the, the whole controversy about rail fares. At one time, government said 85% is being paid by the center, 15 by the states. Then you saw a host of persons uh, showing their tickets that they had themselves 
these migrants out of their meager savings paid uh, uh, for tickets. And when it came up in court, the uh, government was not able to stand by uh, this figure. So who is paying in that context the opposition party, because as I said, we are still a democracy, offered to pay if the government or the PM Cares Fund was not paying. So in that context, I'm saying that it would be good for democracy, it would be good for the functioning of our federal system if all these things were put together in a white paper. Why I say that the federal system is being used as a fig leaf, as a pretext. There is an attempt at what I have called political distancing. You are familiar with social distancing, which I think is an obnoxious term. I think it's more physical distancing that you want stay uh, one or two feet away from, uh, three feet away from someone. Political distancing is when the center distances itself from the negative aspects of this lockdown and uh, tries to pass on the burden to the states, the, the responsibility to the states. Each time the prime minister has come before the nation and talked about uh, the suffering, and he has on two or three occasions, what he has said is, he has asked for forgiveness, that it was not his fault, that there were others who were doing it, and that Shama um, Manta. Now, when people are starving, when people are uh, um, uh, walking miles, there's this girl from who walked, tried to walk from Telangana to, to, uh, to her, this home. Girl. And her name is Jamalo Makdam. She, she was a 20 yes. year old. And she had gone to Telangana to, uh, to pick chilies, as they do. And, and she had been walking and walking and died of exhaustion, not very far from her home. I mean, uh, if I could exactly. just intervene here, I mean, you are saying the shame and scandal of ma migrant workers trudging back home will remain a blot on Republican memory for a long time, surpassing by far the suffering caused by demonetization. At least then the population were at home and confident of earning their livelihood. Even now, there's no word above, from above where the migrants should stay put or go home. Then you say, uh, then you point out the utter chaos that's happening and how different states have reacted differently. Kerala, Karnataka, you've talked about UP and Bihar. And, and the point is that the same government that sacked the, the Delhi government's top officials, uh, the Indian Administrative Service officials, for arranging transport for migrant labor, are now charging them their rail fare. So at a time when we are arguably in a situation where we are today seeing the biggest internal migration, not just in Indian history, surpassing what happened in the middle of the 40s, but perhaps in the history of humankind. This kind of internal migration that we are seeing within India, from one state to another, is perhaps unparalleled in the history of humankind. And in, to, in response to that, the, the, the response of the government of India in Delhi has been, to put it very mildly, inadequate. Some would say their inaction would even be described as criminal. What are your views? I think the sheer scale of it, and I would say muddled thinking and knee-jerk reactions. You rightly pointed out that initially uh, they came down with a heavy hand and, and punished um, the Delhi government officials for arranging transport so that these workers could go home. Now. Uh, they are walking on railway stacks. Just this morning, 15 of them died because a good strain ran over them. The, the sheer uh, brutality of this mass movement of people with no help, with sun blazing, with uh, 
as you the, the, the poor girl died um, probably of dehydration. I want to say is I made this comparison with demonetization. At that time, uh, the central government used all the means and the agencies at its command to implement demonetization. It used the national highways, the toll booths were accepting the money, the petrol pumps were expecting accepting the money, the railways were accepting the money. It used all the instruments at its disposal. Today I ask, what are the central instruments that are being used to uh, fight this battle? The states are on their own. Now the railways are being pressed in. The armed forces were brought in, but for what? They should have been building field hospitals, they should have been building confinement centers, they should have been helping the migrants. They could have ferried them in army trucks uh, back to their homes. They could have distributed so, food. They could have provided them cooked food, drinking water, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, Professor Aroda, I want to uh, take you back to the 40s. And I want to draw a few parallels. And uh, I want your views on the parallels that I'm drawing. I'm drawing three sets of parallels. 1943, the Great Bengal Famine. My parents both came from East Bengal. There was food in the godowns, in the granaries. Yes, food had gone to for the, the armed, the, the allied forces uh, who were fighting the, the Second World War. But the Great Bengal Famine were estimated, I would say, 50 lakh people, 5 million people are supposed to have died. That happened in 1943. In 1945, we had Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill all coming together to defeat Hitler. The Second World War ended. In 1947, we had the partition of India. We had the bloody Hindu-Muslim riots that preceded it and even continued after the 15th of August 1947. The parallels. Look at what the tensions between China and, and the United States. Some would say we are in the middle of a, uh, a third world war, except that the, the complexion, the manner in which it's being fought is very, very different through, through technology, through trade. And, and, and when you look at the, the kind of divide between uh, Hindus and Muslims, many people argue that the divide between Hindus and Muslims today are wider and deeper than they have been since the 40s. So I'd like your views on, on, on these uh, points that I've, uh, on these parallels that I've tried to draw. Yes, I think these are interesting parallels. <clears throat> to take the first one, the Bengal famine. People died and there was food in the, in the go-downs. So, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Today, the Food Corporation of India has three times, more than three times the amount of of, of, of rice and, 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 and wheat, that, that what we would call our buffer stock. Yes, yes, please continue. Quite right. So the food is there. Now look at the situation. As you uh, earlier pointed out, the armed forces could have been used to distribute food. The food is there. How is it being, uh, uh, how is it reaching the hungry? NGOs are asked to uh, take uh, from these go-downs on payment, mind you. So it's charity. The, uh, uh, you're depending on charity. The state is not fulfilling its primary purpose of seeing that the hungry are fed. Uh, they are charged and then they take it and they distribute it. The same NGOs that the government has been I don't think persecuting is a wrong word. It's a str too strong a word. The licenses have been withdrawn totally arbitrarily. And now we are back to uh, asking them to uh, step in. The other parallel that you raise, 47. I uh, was a small child born in Lahore when partition took place. Now, 
I will only compare it because I want to leave aside the communal uh, carnage angle because that raises a whole host of issues. I on, I'm only talking about the scale of the migration from one side to the other, from India to Pakistan and from Pakistan to India. And that movement in those days when independence was barely dawning, where our services were being divided, where the um, officers were being asked to choose between the two uh, new formed nations, we managed to bring things under control and keep functioning, uh, keep the constituent assembly functioning and drafting the constitution during those troubled times and uh, they produced a wonderful document which we can be proud of and which is our mainstay. The point I'm making is that democracy continued to function and the problem was tackled by the state machinery. Today, the state machinery is only coercing and repressing and is not at all trying to bring succor and relief and help to the uh, populations that need it. So uh, uh, your parallels are interesting and uh, uh, we come out very poorly in comparison with what uh, we have, the nation has gone through uh, in those years. What's going to be the political fallout of this, the situation that we're currently going through? What, what would happen if you could kind of sum up, your, sum up your thoughts? You've seen the attempt to politically distance. You know, the government of India wants to distance itself and all the responsibilities are with the states and they are being, uh, I mean, completely strapped for resources to fulfill their role. And then at the same time, you talk about the state machinery being coercive and repressive and not being able to provide succor and relief to those who need them the most. So where do we go from here and what is going to be the likely political fallout? Populations which have been affected, our, our fellow citizens, are likely to remember what their experience has been uh, when the state governments are uh, up for re-election. And if the governments have handled it well, they will presumably reward them. Uh, otherwise, they will punish them. Whether it will have repercussions at the national level, because this whole thing has been uh, masterminded uh, from the center and controlled with uh, special missions, uh, interministerial teams going to the center, <coughs> to the states. Uh, also, the, the whole idea uh, of micromanaging who shall open what on which day and at what time in this vast country. So the only example that is cited is that people forgot demonetization and voted the government back to power. It, the elections uh, are still a, a long way off, but I think that was a different situation. This has caused uh, hardship and misery, which will continue beyond the disease as the economy tries to pick up. Will these workers go back easily to start the industries that they have abandoned? Will the uh, uh, labor that you need, who have built all your cities, Maharashtra, Gujarat, uh, they uh, are leaving, running away for their lives? Will they want to go back and work? So I think this will have long-term implications, which will be with us for a few years more. Thank you so much, Professor Balveer Arora, for giving us your time, for sharing your thoughts and views with the viewers and listeners of NewsClick. Thank you very much once again, and keep watching NewsClick.